kind of teed up uh, Limerick and Waterford nice and, nice and well there. So we might just go into that. It finished uh, Limerick 118, Waterford 19 points. Um, first, thing, like, Waterford were brilliant. and But this was a chance left behind, was it? Like, uh, just to get something on the board here. Like, just some of the wides that were hitting the second half. They clearly had Limerick well frazzled. Uh, Limerick played with 14 men. I think they got the next three points after Hegarty's sending off. Like, where do you start? There was so much to discuss here. But from a Watford point of view, there is that sense of we missed a bit of an opportunity here because they were brilliant. They were brilliant. They were brilliant. And you know what? What, what killed them, I thought, and I thought this would, would lead to a really hard day at the office, was they were so nervy looking at the start. And I think Limerick are gone to that stage, like, you know, they're the boogeyman. They kind of do that to you. They, all, they haven't even tackled you and you're making stupid decisions. But having been tackled you and your touch is off. I think for the first 15 minutes, um, Warford looked like they were afraid to do things. They looked like they looked up, second guessed themselves, ball back in the hurley, run again, but run into trouble. Like the amount of times I can picture that happening um, on several occasions for the first 15 minutes. And Limerick looked like they were just going to have a, an easy day at the office. But in fairness to Warford, they rallied. You know, Stephen Bennett got his couple of scores, got his few frees. And really took it to to them. And in fairness, when the goal went in and Ty Debork went off, um, they rallied. They rallied well, and I think they said Big to themselves, time, yeah. like, "We're we're, just, we're going to have to go for this." In terms of your touch, in terms of breaking tackles, in terms of hitting the ball in at times, and they got a few good go balls into Desi Hutchinson uh, around that period where they after the goal, and I think that showed them, okay, give them a little bit of confidence. They didn't score off of them all the time. But it brought him back into the game, and you know, I suppose Limerick, Limerick will look at themselves and say, "God, we give them, we give them a few easy frees, or certainly scoreable frees there." When was their need? Like the, you know, that tap down on the helmet of Stephen Bennett, like he was running away to the sideline at that stage, and po- possibly would have been swallowed up. Uh, a couple of more flicks, but the only thing I'd say about Limerick is they they play on the edge, so that when the free isn't given, they auto- they, they 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 usually turn you over, they usually swallow you yeah. up. So. Uh, they will probably have to look at that a little bit. Though my, you know, red cards, I'm sure we'll talk about that, the red card. But in terms of their discipline and nearly keeping Watford in it, I think a couple of the fouls there that were, were needless. Um, but after that, Watford were brilliant. I thought they, you know, I, I enjoyed their puck out strategy, uh, to be honest with you. I know that would be getting a bit geeky now, but... Um, no, no, no. It's not, it, was the, it was kind of the overload on, on Dara Burns, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think if you try and move and get a perfect puck out against Limerick, I think they're very good to stop that. And they have their process in place. They have really long athletes, they have really fast athletes, like like the Kilkenny of yesteryear. Um, it has to be absolutely perfect. And your goalkeeper and your outfielder have to be perfect in what they're doing, their execution. So I think, you know, and I admire David Fitz for this, said, I don't think we can actually do that. I don't think we're better than Limerick to do that. So what we'll do is we'll puck it down on Burns, right? I think he caught the first one. But we'll put, puck it down on Burns, but we'll make sure to have more runners coming onto that break. And it was about breaking the ball. Like Watford, Bear Ozzy Gleason aren't fantastic in the air, uh, really. Maybe Mikey Kiley, but probably not as a proven wing forward. So we're going to puck it down in Burns. We're going to jostle into him. We're going to make it hard, make sure he, he doesn't catch it, which should be relatively easy. If you're only concentrating on knocking the ball to the ground, it should yeah. be easy to, you know. Different, uh, show story if you're trying, different story if you're trying to win it, like. Yeah, it's the worst thing yeah. a four can do at times is try and win it because it, it set, you know, it sets the back man up to jump in your back and that's what yeah. the back man you know, prefers. But they always had two or three coming onto the break. And the key to that is, and it's a kind of a defensive puck out too, the key to that then is that even if a Limerick guy wins it, there's still two or three Waterford lads who are coming for the break of the ball and they're that barrier straight away. Whereas if you're trying to play these expensive puck outs and it doesn't come off, suddenly Kyle Hayes is running down your throat. And, and it's like a breakaway in rugby where the whole thing is broken up and it goes from player to player to player to player. And inevitably, you look like you can't win a ball in a half forward line. You look like, oh, geez, they're too slow. Because when a team gets a run in you with the pace and power that Limerick have, it's impossible. It's impossible. Their hands are too yeah. good. They're too fast. So I, I enjoyed that one. And also defensively, um, I think it was their lines. To me, it, they played, no, I didn't see exactly. I'd love to have been there. But it looked like they had four under half back line. A, a, a literal four, not a lad hanging four in there. And the amount of times Daryl Lyons was the player that was with Tom Morrissey and seemed to be following him. And so if you four in that area, as you know, you have a lot less space to cover off. Um, yeah. And so wherever the half-hard line in Limerick run, there seemed to be 
uh, Waterford body with him. I was very impressed with that. Many times the Limerick play and Grode Hegarty or Tom Morrissey or Lynch are after making little runs and they've, they've three, four yards on their opposition player. And certainly after the first 10, 15 minutes the other day, um, and it, it was happening early because you remember a ball that Hegarty had poked out in front of him but bounced awkwardly. He actually had that ball, only it bounced funny and, and it came away to his marker. I think it was um, Fagan. But after that, it didn't seem to happen. They were touch tight and really hard to do that. But I think they had help with an extra half back. But that was very interesting. And if I was a clear, you know, management, somebody in the management team, I'd be looking closely and right, well, how did they do that? And and, 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 and as you see, they, they withdrew one man out. Uh, so they gave the puck out short. But this time, usually if Limerick get a short puck out, they have the movement up front. But there was four and a half back line that didn't allow it. So that was very impressive. I'm going to bring Nisha Waldron in here as well. Um, Nisha, how are you getting on this morning? Well, good, 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 good. That's good. right. We're just, talk- we're just talking about Limerick and, and Watford. Fascinating game. Uh, tactically, I know Shane Dowling did a nice bit of analysis last night showing that they nearly all- Watford nearly always had someone plugging one of the wings to basically deny Nicky, Nicky Quaid, you know, a third of the pitch. What did you make of it? It was a fascinating tactical battle. That, that was the thing, yeah. It was kind of... It was kind of more not as free flowing as the Munster Championship probably has usually been the last couple of years, but like like the way Paddy was saying there, the way Waterford set up with that four across the half back line, and the puck out thing was very interesting as well because like I was at loads of their league games and they were trying something different in every game, and they've all these signals from Billy Nolan that one hand means this, and then the option is go short or put it over the top kind of a thing. They couldn't really do any of that, so the, just driving it long was kind of their go to, but. It was really interesting, really, really interesting, because I didn't think they'd have as many lads back either. Like when I was talking to a few of them, just at the end of the league, they were kind of thinking that Mikey Kiley wouldn't be back, um, and along with a few others there, Daly wouldn't be back. Obviously, he wasn't there, and Austin Gleeson wouldn't have, wouldn't have taken part at all. And I was I was on with a couple of weeks ago with Shane and and, um, and uh, Hennessy, and uh, we were saying I I picked Limerick and Waterford to come out definitely out of Munster. And I didn't. I wasn't sure on the third because just the way the league finished for Tip and Cork, I wasn't sure. And I didn't know what the hell Clare were like. But like after yesterday, I, I still think Waterford would be two of the, uh, one of the three to come out. You would think, but really, really interesting. I th- and I think Waterford would probably be better in the next couple of games. Um, they're, they're very now. Obviously, lo- losing Tyke to Borka is a killer again. Um, he's with like he's just with the one of the most unfortunate fellas. Like he hasn't had a clean run. I remember him coming off in the first round in eighteen. He obviously did the cruciate in the All Ireland final in twenty. Like he's had a really difficult last couple of years. Now they adapted really well without him. I have to say, in fairness, yeah, because Jack Fagan and Caleb Lyons are really comfortable playing that role as well. Because that's they were doing that a lot in the league. They were kind of swapping between who would be doing it and then who was the option for the puck out. More often than not, it was Jack Fagg and like, but yeah, it's just one of them things. Like, I suppose it's the, it's the way it is with the group championship kind of a thing. Like, you have to have a really strong panel. Um, like, and then the Leinster side of it, then look, Wexford are just are, are dead with it, like nearly. But yeah, tied to Borka, like, that's just annoying. It's just annoying even watching it, just seeing it, like, because you're kind of like, just this could be a good old year now for Waterford and for Tyke, and then you're just like, all right, there you go. Yeah, and it was nearly the exact same time he went off in the All-Ireland final against Limerick in 2020 as well. Obviously, Limerick had a massive loss at the far end uh, and John Kiley was fairly non-committal on what Declan Hannon's injury was or the nature of it was. Uh, that meant Mike Casey came in, Dan Morrissey went out to the centre-back. Um, Kiley kind of uh, lobbed a few volleys in the direction of uh, the media, I would say, after anyway, and said it was basically said it was bullshit to talk that they were going to win six in a row and that they were unbeatable and this kind of crack. In fairness, he, he teed it up after the league finally said they were going into the most difficult Munster Championship than that they'd ever been in. I don't know about G, but Paddy, I think this is the perfect scenario for Kylie. They're after getting they're after getting a size 12 up the Swiss roll without losing a match. Oh yeah. Oh that's that's and, and for a team that's all about you know, they'll be all about standards. Any team who's trying to get there they less worry about wins and losses because that's really fluctuating like emotions. Or, but it's all standards with them, so he'll be able to hammer it into him. And he might drop a lad for next week, and he might bring in another lad, and he'll have them all peppering. Like that's that's the way it's going to be, and it's absolutely teed up perfectly for him. And like, it's not going to hit their belief because they've won too many All Irelands to have yeah. any shred of doubt uh, about their belief. But it's just going to. 
you know, even saw Tom Morrissey, I'll tell you, had a great game yesterday. He was he was after being dropped for maybe the league final, was it? The yeah. final, final, league final, Colin O'Neill was in. So, oh, all of a sudden, Tom Morrissey was one of their most, you know, I thought he was one of the players that was bringing it all through the game yesterday. So, now he's going to have 15 lads thinking like that and maybe a panel of 30 that are thinking, well, I'll get a go now uh, since the boys didn't play well last week. So, uh, realistically, not too many would, would, would be dropped, but they're all going to be on high alert. You know, there was a number of lads taken off, a few lads taken off yesterday who wouldn't normally be taken off. And it's the perfect scenario for them. Especially, it came at the real right time as well. It's not a, you know, it's not a stage where it's knockout. They still got the win. Um, it wasn't a stage where um, they needed the, the points. They, they're still, they were still good enough to get through anyway. Um, but now it's just given that little jolt to the whole panel. And it's given him a license to be like a briar in training, which, you know, can only be good for Limerick going forward. Nathan, I'm going to throw this one to you here. Uh, Adrian McGrath question in. Could you talk about the ref when De Borca was on the ground? Uh, no one was in possession. It was just a scramble and ended with the decisive goal. Should the game have been stopped? Now, what? But this kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you remember, Mossy Waters going down uh, yeah. a few years ago. Like, I, I, when, I think when someone looks in great distress in that sort of scenario and the ball's not in someone's hand, it's not like a you know a 75% scoring chance. I think the play should be stopped. And I even was in O'Connor Park yesterday when there was a definite potential HIA like it was clear a fella got a belt in the head and the player was just allowed to develop and then they come back to it like what do you, what do you make of this I just I, I think referees are trying to be a bit too clever in this scenario and I don't know if they think lads are messing on the ground or whatever but it was obvious that he was well, in great distress but yeah the, the Mossy Waters one was, was scandalous like it was actually worse than yesterday like as well because remember the play kept going on around him as well yeah. and it was like really close and it was like lads but Yesterday it was even on the telly, like it was obvious, and the people kind of you could see a couple of the people around him, and the doctors immediately ran in because he was signalling and takes off the helmet as usually when someone goes down with a leg injury and take off their helmet, you usually know, and especially if it's tied to Bork or somebody like that. You, you like my first thought was, is his knee busted again? And then it was like, oh no, he's what it mustn't be his knee, but yeah, like it's like it's like all the rules, really. It's like lads, like. <laughs> I know it's hard and the game is moving faster than ever and all this kind of usual stuff that everyone says, but Jay's like, be consistent with the thing. Like, if yeah. the lad is down and he's genuinely hurt, stop the game. It doesn't matter if if the other team is in possession and they're running in. If they see, like I would feel anyway, if they see that someone is actually, say it's a broken ankle, right? That you kind of go, ah, oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Like, right, right, that's fair enough. Like, let's throw in the ball or give us a free in possession or whatever it is. But like, it had to be stopped. I, d- I don't know. I don't know why, maybe, he, and you can't really say he couldn't see him. I mean, he's a big man playing centre-back with a red helmet, um, and he's all, all of a sudden on the ground. <laughs> you know? So you can't, you can't say he didn't see him, because he's, he, he's there around the play, like, and he's lying on the ground. You know, so, I, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to ask the ref, you see, just the thing. There were probably a few uh, controversial enough refereeing decisions. Uh, I know Garone Hegarty got sent off. We'll come to that in a second. Paddy, what did you make of the, the Nash one, I think, is a flick with the hurl with an attempt to get the ball, albeit a nice bit away from it. Um, but to me, the Seamus Flanagan's shoulder is a different type of thing completely. Um, and that's very, very dangerous. And that wasn't dealt with at the time, which means they could go back to it uh, retrospectively. What did you make? Like To me, it, it, it was a red card. And do you think that's something that they'll maybe look at um, over the coming days? Uh, I definitely think they'll look at it uh, since it wasn't dealt with. I think... I would say a red card probably, and and he certainly put himself in a position to get a red card. Uh, it's the problem here is, I know it it was slowed down, right, and that's that's a big problem because it's not real time. So the replays we probably saw all the replays in a slow motion, so it looks like he had loads of time to change what he was doing. But to me, the ball was flicked, and it wasn't innocuous like you know you just kept going and that's the way it was. He did turn into him. He saw it was there, and there was no attempt at all to, to pull away or to alter your body position. You know, there, there's even a flinch you might do to just get your shoulder away from that position. You might hit him with your chest. By it accident. stayed high, yeah. It stayed high, didn't it? And, and, it, and you know, he saw, he saw what was happening. So I think Seamus Flanagan uh, was very lucky not to get a red card yesterday. Uh, I think that there was no action taken. Even when I saw it, you know, the, the, you know, on the screen first, I said, whoa, that's a, that's a free. I didn't know where he had hit him. I said, geez, yeah. that's a free. That's a, a full-on frontal shoulder. Uh, even if the ball is gone, that's still a, that's still a free. It doesn't matter. Um, so that was me just watching live on TV. But 
when when you connect with somebody's so somebody's face guard, um, then you can expect a red. And the onus, you know, it can be innocuous if it's all the one movement, uh, like before, you know, Nash's when Nash collided with Fagan. I think he was in trying to make a hurling movement to flick the ball and just innocuously hit off Fagan's, you know, face guard. I think that can happen, but. You know, when when you're going in for a ball and you're going into shoulder, the onus is on you as as the defender or as the person tackling, not to hit somebody in the head. And very much, I know there's always an issue with, with Richie Hogan's in the All Ireland. But when you make the movement to actually go with your shoulder, you have to hit the shoulder. Or even even if you hit him in the a little bit in the chest or or just off target on the shoulder, you might get a yellow. But if you hit him on the head and you've gone in for a tackle, then you can only expect a red. I think. Paddy, I'm going to let you go on that one because I know you have, uh, you have kids to teach there, so I really appreciate your time. Thanks a million, Paddy. Talk no to you again. Lads. Thank you. See you, Paddy. See you, Paddy. Nisha, I'll just throw it back to you there. The the Garod Hegarty uh, sending off. Uh, I, I think the first yellow was for back chat. Um, I don't think he was happy with a decision uh, that yeah. was made. Uh, it, was, it was definitely mountain of some kind anyway. Don't really think he can have any argument with the second one. Uh, it was... Well, to me, it looked it looked... Into it, it almost looked into his chest, and you know Conor Gleeson is going down, and he's a bit smaller. What did you make of that incident? And then the Waterford mentor, um, Ollie Power, who had no business being where he was, um, and, and that's not something like he had no business being there. Like he wasn't in that vicinity, and he put himself in that vicinity. Just talk me through your own thoughts on that. Yeah, like the the yeah the first yellow obviously was Mountain, the second yellow. Look, he had him lined up. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was going to absolutely drive him into the stand with a shoulder. You see that fairly often and all. But, yeah, because he didn't get him nailed on shoulder to shoulder, like, it has to be a yellow card. And then there's your second yellow card. Like, it's, it's just simple as that, right? Uh, you're always kind of walking a bit of a tightrope when you get a yellow card for talking. Because then it's like, right, if I give away one more bad foul here now, I'm, I'm going to get a yellow. So I actually, I was actually surprised that they, that they didn't take him off before that. I kind of thought nearly at half time because he got the yellow in the first half, didn't he? The first one, yeah. yeah. So I kind of nearly even thought at half time. She's like, I'd probably be looking. It was like when Ryan O'Doyer used to get a yellow card for Dublin. Like, <laughs> take him off, take him off, take him off now. But like that kind of Every thing. Every time he goes to tackle somebody, you're taking <laughs> Ryan and he just couldn't help himself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, and that was the thing. Like, you just kind of, but look, they still won with 14, but. But Ali Power, not sure what he was doing there, really. Like, I remember, again, Dublin, I suppose, a couple of years ago, I remember when Greg Kendy jumped up and caught the quick free. Oh, yeah. And yeah. people were going mental, like, you know, whatever. But this was far worse. Like, you cannot touch a player. I don't care how hard he hit him, uh, how soft he hit him. It was only a tap people are saying. It doesn't matter. You cannot touch him unless you're holding him up from falling or something. But, like, yeah. you can't thump him into the... Like, so... Who knows what will happen, Oli Power? But that that was that was madness. I get the whole heat at the moment and like fire. No, if you're no, if you're there, Nisha, if you're if you're standing right beside the incident, that's one thing. But to put yourself into the incident is another but, thing completely. But that's what I mean to to step out and and yeah. then to do the like whatever, like you know, it's like because it's a kind of a case of. What would he have done if you'd have boxed him in the face, like, and next thing all hell broke loose? And it's like, yeah. you're a man, and I, I don't know what age Ollie Power is, but all of a sudden, there you're against like the, the biggest athletes in Hurling, and they all are <laughs> backing you. Suppose he, like, this one winner, thing, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then not only that, but then dragging all the rest of the old lads into it as well, like, you know, it's kind of <laughs> like, but like, it, it just it was it was mad, like, it was kind of. It was kind of funny when they were showing the replay and like it now, but it, it's it, it's fairly serious as well. Like, because it's like, what are you doing? And now you've lined yourself up. You're probably not going to be allowed to be on the sideline again for the rest of the year, yeah. I'd imagine. Like, because you, you can't do that. Like, you can't be doing that, as the lad would say. <laughs> but like, you can't. It's just it's madness, madness. Uh, just, just on that as well, Davy and Owen Kelly and Peter Queeley would be like, in one way, like the momentum going into next weekend, but Nick Davy and Davy talked about, but Davy did talk about, you know, a crestfallen dressing room and trying to get them back up for like, but they, they delivered so much and still have nothing to show for it. Um, and all they have to, and in a way, all they have to show for it is tied to Borka's injury and a lot of uh, physical fatigue going into next weekend. Like, can they, can they continue in that vein uh, and produce something big against Cork and get a result against Cork next weekend? Uh, I, I I think they could, yeah. Now the, the worst part of it is, right? I think is losing Tyke, um, to Borca. Whatever about losing, winning or losing the game, 
it's just it's it's far worse losing tight to Borca because now all of a sudden you have to remodel an awful lot and people will be starting that you were kind of relying on coming in. And, and, and just you know, on whatever. that, it's a different story losing a guy mid-game, I always think. You know, lads step up mid-game and play centre-back. Like, you'd yeah. slip into a spot, but to start a big game, centre-back against, like you're going to be marking, you're going to be marking, uh, you're going to be marking one of the best players in the opposition team from the start. And you're thinking about it. When you're not thinking about it, it's almost easier to do, if you get me. Yeah, when you're when you're thrown in and the game has already opened up, like and yeah, it, it's totally different. It's totally different. that's why like there's so many lads you want know, to go, Jesse's great coming off the bench, but yeah. and then they don't get started and you're kinda of going, Well, you bring him on with twenty five minutes to go in every game, just playing. But you know, some people are different. But um yeah, it'll be it'll be it, it will be tough, but I think they're good enough to do it, like and they're set up well enough, like the way I I think they'll be they, they probably, you know, would be nearly better against Cork, uh, I think, because Limerick are so physical and so good and so fast and so skillful and they are set up like they smothered them in the first like they smothered Waterford let's say in the first 10 minutes like like from sideline cuts from puck outs from long range freeze they had no options and how many times yeah. did Waterford turn the ball over it was crazy and like funny thing as well is like if you're I suppose you'd be trying to nail on the positives all the time where you're kind of going only for a lot of bad shooting lads right oh, we, yeah. we really w- would have won that game like I'd be kind of trying to Get that back, get, or you know, reinforce that, reinforce that. And I think Desi Hutchison, for example, will have far more space against Cork than he did against Limerick. I tell you, Patrick Fitzgerald looked like he's been there years when he came on. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Potty know, Fitzgerald, remember the block, Potty Fitzgerald on, on Aaron Galan as well, the, the double the, save. Billy Nolan the, did brilliant as well at different stages yesterday too for a lad that hasn't hasn't played many championship games. This this, this the thing, like yeah, like he stopped. Uh, I, I was just going to talk about like the. You know the pass, you know Hegarty's chance for a goal, Billy Nolan saved in the first half. That pass from Flanagan was unbelievable. Oh, yeah. unbelievable. And Tom like, Barn the... actually, Tom Barn was that fixated with Hegarty that he wasn't looking at the ball across. He was just looking at Hegarty because he knew he could kind of sense what was going to happen. And like it just went from the sideline under the stand right into Hegarty's hand, like, and it was like that is an unbelievable pass. So everyone kind of, I know a lot of people kind of keep going back to, oh, they're the best coach and they're the best system and all that. They also have the best hurlers. <laughs> Like they like to, to to pull that off, and Hegarty's just standing there. But anyway, Billy Nolan, it was a good, really good save. He stopped a penalty as well. So you know, like there are a lot of positives from Water. Like, uh, but and yeah, I I still think they're probably going on yesterday, probably the second best team. But obviously, yeah, look, you, you, playing Limerick first can be a bit of a drag uh, physically. Um, because my God, they, they just hit everything that moves. Like, geez, like so, it will be tough. It will be tough, but I think I think they will do it. If you look at the physical toll that really throwing it down to Limerick takes on teams, for example, like Clare weren't able to produce anything of great note after really throwing it down to them in a Munster final. Even Kilkenny, after beating them in nineteen, didn't produce much in the All Ireland final. There's a couple of more, even I remember thinking before. Um, the other thing I was going to say to you, don't this reminds me of as well. I don't know if you follow the boxing, but they always said that Oscar De La Hoya had the blueprint to beat Fly Mayweather, even yeah. though he, even though he didn't beat him because I think it was like a split, deci- split decision, points defeat or something like that, or Mayweather won a, on on a split decision. But like, do you think a lot of teams are going to look at Limerick now and look at what Water did and try and replicate it? And on the flip of that, Kinnerk is going to be Kinnerk, uh, Angus O'Brien, Alan Cunningham, and John Kiley, and Sean O'Donnell, the stats man, are going to be like. Jesus, we cannot allow this to happen again. We have to find workarounds and ways to make sure that we're not stifled by something like this. Because a lot of teams will probably start doing that type of setup. They'll probably plant someone on one of the wings and make sure Nicky Quaid has less options on a puck out. Yeah, yeah. And see, this was the, this was the reason why I kind of was talking about Waterford a good bit before the championship was like the way they set up in the backs. Like, and again, like, with the, like it was immediate, right? When, when we played with, with the underdogs, like, you were there, like, they have about eight lads in the backs here, at least at times, like. Mm. And then against Dublin in the league, especially, like, I, I had a highlight package put together for it. And then in preparation for the tip game, but then they did the opposite for the tip game. So they were trying all these different things. But I that's why I thought Waterford were probably the best set up. And then now, look, Tyg is going to be gone now, but because they had Tyg in the middle. And then Caleb Lyons and Jack Fagan running on either wing to carry it out, like with the power and stuff. So, yeah, they have the blueprint, but do the other teams have the players? Like, this is the thing. Like, who else has mm-hmm. the ferocious athleticism of, and skill of Jack Fagan and Caleb Lyons carrying? And then Daryl Lyons being able to sit back as well and help out Ty. And then, you know, 
like he picked up an, an enormous amount of balls. So like, yes, it's probably the blueprint, but then you have, <laughs> the other thing as well is right. You know, you kind of say, yeah, they, they hit an awful lot of bad wides from distance, but like that was because it was probably the only option they had. And then you're tired and you're just going, I'm just shooting. And, uh, it goes wide. So like Limerick kind of force you to make all these mistakes, like mentally, physically, they drain you to a point where, you know, someone runs up from wing back and shoots from 80 yards. And you're kind of going, As we've talked about this for the last month, don't do that. But then yeah. they just force you to do it. And then one of the Morrissey's was talking as well during the league too, um, after on, on GABO, and he was saying about Knurk, like back to your point, where he sets up basically all these scenarios on how to beat Limerick and then they play them in training. That's so right. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. So it's like, yes, yes, we play this way and this is what, what we're really good at. But here's how you lose here's how you beat that. And then so so they like like you know they're, they're unbelievably intelligent, they're really well coached. They to, you know, so they'll be ready again. And and like again, like kind of Paddy was saying too about about John Kiley, like talk about a shoe to beat them with or whatever like like, they, they, like they're welcoming Claire next week, like and Claire, Claire will be yeah. coming all guns blazing, like 